Hi, I'm Patrick Connor from the University of Georgia Horticulture Department. I'm going to be talking to you today about muscadine cultivars. Now, I don't have time during this talk to give an exhaustive review of all the different cultivars. So instead, what I'm going to do is give you some information on some things to think about when choosing a muscadine cultivar, and then give some of the more common uh, cultivars that I've been seeing growing in vineyards today. Probably the first thing you wanna think about when picking a muscadine cultivar is what you're gonna do with that cultivar. Is it gonna be used for juice in, in terms of either juice or wine production? Or is it gonna be a cultivar you're gonna mainly be using for fresh eating? Wine juice cultivars need to be high yielding cultivars, big healthy vines, uh, produce a good bricks, uh, but berry skin, um, Toughness is not real important for a juice cultivar, and berry size is also not very important. Uh, but if you're looking for a fresh market grape, this is a grape that needs to be a large size. Uh, generally, you want a firm berry so that it's um, not objected to by the grocery stores for being too soft. Uh, and you also want a berry with a dry picking scar so you can pack them without getting juice all over the berries and kind of making a sticky mess. Some of the newer cultivars also have a much crisper skin, uh, which enables you to eat the skin as well as the berry, which the consumers generally tend to prefer. The second thing you wanna think about when choosing a muscadine cultivar is what the flower type is. Uh, muscadine cultivars right now can be either female flowered or perfect flowered. Uh, growers generally prefer a perfect flowered cultivar because the yields are higher. Uh, but sometimes we are stuck with um, female flowered cultivars because the female flowered varieties oftentimes have bigger berries and a little better quality berry. So I think right now growers are really um, switching over to perfect flowered varieties. I think probably 20, 30 years in the future, vineyards will be composed of only perfect flowered varieties. But we're still in a transition phase right now where some cultivars are female and some are perfect flowered. Uh, the problem with the female varieties is the yield is oftentimes lower and inconsistent in them. If you look at a female flower like this um, flower here on the right, you can see as the flower um, gets near its uh, receptivity, the calyptor sizes from the base of the flower and then it pops off the top of the flower and that exposes the stigma, which is then where the pollen lands to fertilize the berry. The problem with the female flowered varieties is sometimes if you have a dry spring uh, and for other unknown reasons, instead of the cap absizing like this one does and will pop off, it dies before it absizes and then it shrinks down onto the top of the stigma and it never comes off. This means the pollen can't land on the stigma, the flower can't get pollinated, and then you do not have a berry form because you don't have any seeds to make the berry form. Uh, and due to this capstick problem, uh, yields in female varieties are oftentimes only about half of those in the perfect flowered varieties. The third thing to think about is berry size. Like I said before, uh, if you're juicing or making wine, berry size is not important. Uh, but if you're looking at a fresh market um, cultivar, berry size can be very important. Consumers still like, in general, a bigger fruit. And so we generally prefer to have a larger berry size for fresh market cultivars. Uh, generally self-fertile cultivars are smaller than the female cultivars, uh, but they do tend to be more consistent in size because you're getting very good uh, pollination in the self-fertile varieties. You have a consistent number of seeds per berry and that gives you a more consistent size. In general, we say for fresh market cultivars, we want a minimum size of 10 to 11 grams, and that produces a berry, it's about an inch in diameter. If you're selling your berries in clamshells like this on the, these berries on the right, uh, it's a little less important on berry size uh, because they're packed together and they don't stick out as individual berries. And again, that minimum size, 10 to 11 grams, is okay for the clamshells. Uh, but if you're selling the berries in a large box, like a 20 pound box where you're picking out individual berries, 
Oftentimes, uh, the very large berries sell better in that type of packing format. And in those cases, uh, a berry like Supreme, which is like 15 grams, is preferred. Uh, in the past, the self-fertile cultivars usually were only 10 to 11 grams, uh, but some new self-fertile cultivars like Pock and Ruby Crisp can be up around the 15 gram and be nearly as big as some of the biggest female cultivars. Uh, for fresh market, uh, dry stem scars uh, and firm flesh is important. Uh, what you don't want is to have, when you pick the berries, for the skin to tear off of the berries at the picking scar. And especially if it opens up into the flesh like this, and then you combine that with a very soft flesh, you can get juice that'll leak onto the berries. Uh, over time, that can produce mold if you're, if you're storing the berries. Uh, the berries will get sticky and kind of nasty looking in the box. And so you, ideally you want a very dry stem scar with no tearing or splitting. Uh, some cultivars, uh, because you can't pack the berries that split, uh, you oftentimes wind up trying to juice uh, or just throw out the berries which tear, and that's gonna be up to a third of the cultivars, or a third of the berries in cultivars with wet scars. Uh, tends to be less important for you pick because the, the consumer is taking them home and usually eating them or processing them fairly quickly and you're not storing them. Uh, so you can tolerate a little more of the wet scars for that, for the juice pick or the you pick. And then for juice cultivars too, it's better to have dry scars, uh, but if you're juicing them relatively quickly, it's not nearly as important. Uh, you want vigorous disease resistant vines. Uh, some of the new cultivars, uh, including some of the cultivars from our program like Lane, are not quite as vigorous as we would like and you tend to have to baby them a little more. Uh, and so ideally you would have a more vigorous vine than that. In terms of disease resistant, generally the bronze cultivars have much more trouble with the fruit rots than do the purple cultivars. Uh, and it's also more of a problem if you're in, say, lower Georgia or maybe the very edge of the coastal plain in North Carolina. Uh, there you tend to have more rots than you do in the Piedmont areas. So if you're going to plant uh, bronze types, uh, pretty much all the bronze berries are going to rot. Uh, you should plan on spraying those berries. Uh, and be aware that many fungicides have a 14 day pre-harvest interval. And so when you're planting your bronze berries, if you can plant the late varieties separate from the early varieties, that's preferable so that you can get another extra spray on the late varieties and protect them while the early varieties are being harvested. The final thing to think about uh, is cold hardiness. Unfortunately, we don't have great data on the cold hardiness of a lot of our vines. Uh, myself being located in South Georgia, we have less of a problem with cold than say North Carolina would have. And I don't get good data uh, collected on my varieties for cold hardiness. Uh, the one thing I would note though, is that anytime you overcrop a vine, it is much more susceptible to cold damage the following winter. And so varieties like Supreme, uh, Granny Val, Pock, uh, Lane, all these varieties tend to, especially on a younger vine, want to overcrop. And if you allow them to overcrop, you are more, much more likely to see winter damage uh, on them that, that, that winter. And so you really want to try to control crop load is one of the primary things you can do to reduce winter damage. I was also know that Supreme, although it's a very popular fresh market cultivar, has been shown in the past to have um, some issues with winter damage in the more colder um, muscadine regions. Uh, I divided up the fresh market cultivars into uh, purple and bronze cultivars. And I'm gonna talk just a little bit about each of the ones uh, that we recommend in those two categories. Uh, for the purple cultivars, uh, early season, we recommend Lane, mid-season, Supreme and Delicious, and Pock and Ison are also are all planted to some extent. 
Uh, Lane uh, was released from the University of Georgia program. Uh, probably the biggest downside to Lane is that it only has moderate vigor and productivity. Uh, because of that, you want to monitor your nutrition and maybe uh, give them a little extra fertilizer in, in early summer uh, and control the crop load on young vines. It's a medium berry size, only about nine grams. Uh, would be suitable for clamshell, but not, not, not a great choice for um, an open box. Uh, the reason we uh, still recommend Lane to some extent is that it's really the only self-fertile early black cultivar. Uh, in South Georgia, we can start picking Lane usually at the end of July, definitely by the first week of August. Uh, the berries have a very firm flesh. They hold on the vine well and usually have a good bricks. Um, occasionally, you have issues with wet scars in lane, uh, especially if you try to pick it right after a rain. So you might want to monitor when you pick it. Uh, Supreme Muscadine uh, is by far the most popular purple fresh market muscadine being grown in Georgia. Uh, it's excellent size, averages about 15 grams. A very firm fruit with a fairly crisp skin, and it stores probably the best of any berry we've trialed in terms of cold storage. Uh, it holds a long time in cold storage, several weeks sometimes, uh, and it keeps its firmness uh, instead of getting soft. Uh, downside is the vine vigor is a little bit low, and it's a very productive vine, so you need to monitor crop load to a certain extent. Uh, and the other problem we have is sometimes the berries um, split on the picking scar. Uh, and so you, you wind up having to discard some of the berries because of that splitting. Uh, Pock Muscadine is a recent University of Georgia release. Uh, we released it as a potential replacement for Supreme. It has self-fertile flowers and very large berry size, about 15 grams. It's a main season variety, uh, does not tend to have early berries. Uh, and so you can't, you need an early variety uh, to go along with Pawk. Uh, storage ability is, is good, not, as, not quite as good as Supreme. Uh, very good picking scar, much better than Supreme. Very few will split on you. Uh, and it doesn't tend to hold on the variety as well as Supreme. So currently we kind of recommend a mix of Pawk and Supreme in your vineyard. Uh, and use the best categories of each in your operation. Uh, a couple other ones that are occasionally used as purple varieties. One is Delicious. Uh, this was University of Florida release. It's self-fertile, medium-sized berry, about 10 grams. So it's, it's okay for clamshells. Uh, it can overcrop um, fairly badly, uh, but the vine health usually remains good even with the overcropping. Uh, it's a vigorous vine. Uh, it's a more of a traditional muscadine in terms of it has a tough skin and a soft pulp, but it has a very good flavor uh, and is being used somewhat uh, in South Georgia. Another one very similar to delicious in terms of its use is ice and muscadine. Again, medium size, about 10 grams. It's self-fertile. Uh, it's a nice, um, vigorous vine. Uh, doesn't have any real disease problems. Like Delicious, it's got a tough skin and a soft pulp, uh, which would be okay for clamshell sales. Uh, personally, I like a Delicious a little bit better because it has a drier scar and better flavor. Uh, but Delicious is a tougher cultivar to find in terms of buying plants than is Ison. For bronze market, uh, fresh market cultivars, early season, recommend uh, we have Hall and Early Fry mid-season fry, and then late-season Granny Val and late fry. Uh, Hall is a University of Georgia release. Um, it has good vigor and productivity. Uh, we released it as a replacement for Terra. It has better flavor than Terra and a little bit more attractive um, berry color. Uh, you can see it here on the bottom. It's got kind of a more of a yellowish green color instead of the green of Terra. And it doesn't have the pinkish color of the Triumph. Uh, we'll get sometimes. Uh, excellent picking scar. You have very, very few that split or tear. Uh, size is similar to most other self-fertile cultivars at 10 grams, uh, making it useful for clamshells. 
Uh, in terms of an er, uh, a very large berry size, early season cultivar, uh, we have early fry. Uh, this is a female vine. It can be as large as 15 grams. Uh, the flavor early fry, I usually find to be quite good. Uh, the only downside I'd say with early fry is it is female and therefore production can be variable. Uh, and the berries sometimes have this kind of dirty appearance you can see here on the, the far right. Uh, they get a little bit of waxy bloom on the berries, they get a little bit of pinkish undertones, and um, especially in a box, sometimes just not real attractive. Main season, uh, we're still recommending fry. That's been the standby uh, for a couple decades now. Uh, fairly large size, uh, about 13 grams in fry. Uh, big advantage of fry is great flavor. Uh, even when you pick it a little bit green before it's fully soft, uh, it is still a, a good flavor at that point. Uh, productivity of fry, it's female and the uh, productivity can be variable from year to year. Uh, it is disease susceptible as are most bronze varieties and you can have a somewhat wet picking scar. Uh, growers would like to have a replacement for fry uh, both in terms of getting a self-fertile um, flower as well as to get a better picking scar. But right now we don't quite have a, a suitable replacement for fry yet. Uh, for late season, uh, Granny Val has been a popular choice. Uh, it's self-fertile, a very productive vine. In fact, it can be a little bit overproductive, uh, which will result in a little bit reduced quality in terms of having um, a lower bricks in the berries. Uh, I find the flavor of Granny Bow often to be only average to poor. It can be a little bit acidic and maybe not quite as much bricks as we would like. Uh, but it does seem to have a little better disease resistance and drier scar than our other late season choice, which is late fry. Uh, late fry, again, it's late season cultivar. So these are coming off towards the end of August in South Georgia. Uh, we see a little more fruit rot in um, the late fry than we seem to see in Granny Bow. Uh, and it has a softer berry uh, and can have a wet scar, uh, but it does have a better flavor than Granny Val. I think if I were growing them for you pick, I would probably prefer late fry uh, for commercial sales uh, where you're trying to pick them and market them. I maybe would go with Granny Val instead. In terms of juice cultivars, really it still comes down to Noble and Carlos. Uh, Noble is usually used for the, the purple grape for juice cultivars. And there's really no replacement for Noble in terms of a juice cultivar that's purple. Uh, Carlos is the most common used bronze grape for juicing, uh, but you can, there are a couple other varieties like Welder and Doreen and Magnolia that are also sometimes used. Uh, both these varieties are very good varieties, very productive vines and very vigorous vines and fairly cold hardy. Uh, generally for juice cultivars, you want to know um, what your buyer wants and that will determine what you're going to grow in terms of the cultivar. Uh, if you're going to be juicing them yourselves and using them, uh, it's possible you would like a different variety, uh, but there would have to be a compelling reason to plant a different variety. And, and oftentimes there really isn't any reason to switch from Noble or Carlos right now. So that's just kind of a quick overview of our varieties. Uh, you can find some more information. You can search for us under UGA Muscadine Breeding in both Google and YouTube. Uh, we'll pull up some further information on these varieties as well as some other varieties.